Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Welcome to our thoughts for the day. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Well, good morning and welcome to our service here in Green Island Presbyterian Church. It's great to have you with us this morning. And certainly my thoughts and many of our thoughts, I'm sure, are drawn towards the conflict overseas at the minute. Uh, and as we certainly move into our, our worship this morning, we want to read a psalm that reminds us that, that God is our rescuer in times of difficulty. It's God that gives us strength when everything around us seems to be falling apart. Uh, I was minded even just of the words uh, of Robin McGee, who spoke to us a number of weeks ago regarding the persecuted church um, that frequently uh, has to live through times of conflict and war and difficulty. And our brothers and sisters who are constantly in hiding, our brothers and sisters who are constantly uh, having to find safety in the middle of difficulty. And they fall upon the words of the psalm as much as any of us. We'll be praying later in our service, particularly for the situation in the Ukraine at the minute. Uh, and all of us, I would encourage to join together in our prayers and lift up this nation and the difficulties that surround it at this time. Uh, pray for our government and its response. Pray for the governments both East and West and our responses and to this most difficult of time as we see um, men and women and families losing their lives in the midst of all of this. Our sometimes only help and hope in this is in God, because certainly we are unequipped to change any of this. And as we go into our service, we may be joined with the words of the psalmist, particularly of David in Psalm 18, who clearly cries out to God at a time of difficulty. And I encourage you to read the whole psalm in your own time. But he starts with saying this, I love you, Lord, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. He then goes through the psalm to talk about all the things that are besieging him and making him life difficult. But throughout all he remembers that his God will look after him. And we pray that God will look after those men and women in the Ukraine at present. But having gone through all this, he says, For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed. Well, I don't even know what difficulty you're going through at the minute. But may you too be able to fall upon God, who is our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our refuge and our shield in these days. As we pray for them, we also pray for one another. But let's, like David, turn into praise at this time. Let's call upon the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. As he finishes the psalm, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. May we do likewise. And we join together to lift our voices in praise as we sing together our first hymn now.
Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Colossians. We're going to read chapter 2 and verse 9 through to verse 15. Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 to 15. Uh, we see at the beginning of it uh, a couple of times where it just says, in him. Uh, we need to recognize we're talking about Christ at that point. It's in Christ. Uh, so let's begin reading at um, verse 9 through to verse 15. This is the word of God to us this morning. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your, in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Amen. We pray that God will lead and teach us from his word today. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we look at our TV screens with a combination of shock, disbelief and horror as we watch one country invade another, as we see one country through bomb and bullet through armour and plane, invade and attack another. And Lord, we re recognise that not everything is straightforward and not everything is obvious and politics and international politics are often confusing. But to us, it seems like such an act of unwarranted aggression that it breaks our heart. We have not seen the like in certainly in Europe, Father, for over 50 years. And we pray for the Ukraine, Father. We pray for Russia. We pray for the surrounding countries and the fear that they may get drawn into this. We pray for NATO and we pray for Western and Eastern countries in the middle of all of this. For we've seen in the past that what happens in one country can escalate and draw in many. We ask for peace to come into the middle of this, Father. We ask for diplomacy to be reinstated and to thrive. We ask for protection of soldiers that are Ukrainian, soldiers that are Russian. We pray for protection of men, women and children in the middle of this. With indiscriminate shelling, with indiscriminate gunfire. We pray for protection of those who bear arms, as well as for those who do not. And we want to see peace reign here, Father. We want to see an opportunity and a space for conversation and diplomacy. And we recognize, Father, these are just difficult and brutal days, and we feel so helpless, which is why we come to you today, Father, and ask for you to move on this country of conflict at the moment. We pray for leaders that have become hard-hearted. And to our understanding, Father, leaders that have become proud, arrogant and vain. We pray for a breaking of that, for a breaking down of that, Father, and for a change of heart. And that is certainly something we can almost not imagine, but you can do more than we can think or imagine. And so we pray for a change of heart in those who are driving this conflict. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. 
Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest who saved his love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My Unfortunately, their number 10 had a good boot on him. Because there's nothing more frustrating than fighting your way up the pitch in a game of rugby. Doing your best to get right up and you maybe get into their 22 and whenever they get their hands in the ball for whatever reason, their number 10, who's got a good boot on them, kicks the ball three quarters of the way back down the pitch. And you've got to start all over again. All that hard work is undone in the blink of an eye when you've got a number 10 who's got a good boot on him. And I remember this being done to us 
Uh, we had four away up the pitch uh, against a better team. And unfortunately, the ball, I think, it got knocked on. And the 10 latched onto it and hoofed it as hard as he could. Uh, and even better than that there, their wingers charged up the flanks either side, chasing this ball. And one of our guys, the ball bubbled around a bit and he, he, he leapt upon it. Uh, and as he did so, then their winger leapt upon him. And there's me shouting out, you know, you have to let him up, you have to let him up. Used to be that in rugby, if you went down and collected the ball, the attacking or the now defending team had to let you regain your feet before they could attack you or attack the ball. So I'm screaming, you have to let him up, you have to let him up, thinking we're about to get a penalty. Only to hear a maybe slightly sarcastic voice from the sidelines. Cheeky, definitely. Say to me, mate, but she's that rule six years ago. So there's me screaming like a fool about a rule that had changed many years before. I was playing by rules that don't count anymore. And the Apostle Paul, he comes up against that over and over again in the New Testament. People playing by religious rules that don't count anymore in the light of Jesus and his death, resurrection and ascension. Paul had a real problem when he ministered in areas that contained both Gentiles and Jews. Because all too often the Jewish new Christians would insist that the Gentiles uh, had to undergo the Jewish practices regarding things like circumcision and dietary laws and, and festival practices. But Paul was saying to them, you know, that, that's the old rules, that's the old stuff. With Jesus, these things have passed away. Jesus has brought us the new covenant. There are fresh understandings of the relationship between us and God, solidified in the death of Jesus upon the cross. So today we read in our passage that, that Paul is reassuring the new Gentile Christians that things are different for them. But he begins almost with a really confusing phrase he says to them you have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands now one of the joys of my nurse training days was to work in white abbey hospital in the surgical wards uh, and one of the days that i was working there was uh, a day dealing with circumcisions and let me tell you categorically and without fear of contradiction, all of those circumcisions were done using hands. On no occasion did the surgeon use his or her feet. On no occasion did the surgeon attempt a, a circumcision simply through the power of their minds. So what does Paul mean when he talks about a circumcision not done by hands? Well, one of the important things to remember here is that within the greater part of Jewish thinking, there was a clear separation between the physical act of circumcision, which was carried out on boys when they were young. So there's a clear separation from that physical act of circumcision and what they would have termed the circumcision of the heart. They recognized that the physical sign of circumcision in itself did not make a Jew acceptable before God. It was how you lived as a Jew. It's how you um, lived in faith and attendance to the Pentateuch, to the Torah, to the law. And in the same way, we uh, baptized three babies in the past month over in the church. You know, their baptism does not make them Christians. What will make the children that we baptize Christians is their own acceptance of Jesus as their Lord and Savior at some later point in their lives. So Paul is saying to the Gentiles who are following Jesus that you have the same circumcision of the heart because you've chosen to follow Jesus as any faithful Jew. And then he pushes the imagery on even further because that's been very much a sort of Old Testament imagery that he's using. But he pushes into uh, New Covenant imagery as well. 
Because straight after talking about this circumcision without hands, the circumcision of the heart, he talks about baptism and he talks about faith. Interestingly, in baptism, he talks about our death. And then pinwheeling on that, he talks about our life coming through faith. And this is important for us to carry. Uh, and I'm not a great studier of the reformers. I, it's one of the areas that everybody could be a better student. But my understanding is that for the reformers, baptism was a sign of two things. It was our utter inability to save ourselves. We came like helpless babes, helpful infants. And it was also a sign of God's utter saving faithfulness. We go into the waters of baptism, but it's God that draws us out. Whenever I think of, of salvation and baptism and faith, I frequently think around the, the image of the Coast Guard. You know, when someone is five miles out in stormy waters in a sinking boat, you don't say, oh, I'm sure they'll make it back all right. I'm sure they're a grand swimmer. They'll be fine. No, what you do is you engage the, the Coast Guard. You phone the Coast Guard and you say, someone needs saved. Someone needs help. And the Coast Guards, you know, they don't go out and park 500 yards away from the person in the sea sinking and say, oh, come on, see if you can make it. Swim on over. Do you, you know, put a bit of effort in. Put a bit of effort in. Make an effort before we'll get you out of the water. You know, if you come halfway towards me, then we'll come towards you and we'll lift you out. That's not what happens either. There's a recognition that the person in the water is wholly helpless. And so the Coast Guard comes right up close. It either drops a swimmer in from the air in a helicopter or it brings a boat right up beside the person struggling. In the waters, we recognize that we are absolutely stuffed without a savior. We're stuck without a rescuer. And we take that similar image as we pour the waters over our children in baptism. Recognizing that we have a great rescuer. We have the only one who can permanently rescue us from the grip of death. And it is our trust in him. It is our faith in him that makes all the difference. Helplessly we are in the water, but he can lift us out of it. And Paul phrases it this way. He says, we have been buried with him in baptism. In which you were also raised through him. Through faith. In the powerful working of God. You were buried with him in baptism. In which you were also raised with him through faith. In the powerful working of God. So Paul is drawing together these old and new covenant images. And saying to the Gentiles. These all relate to you as much as they do to anyone else. It highlights again Paul's insistence that the gospel is for everyone. No person is disqualified due to racial background, class background, creed background, cultural background. Because what makes the difference is not some kind of physical sign of God's covenant faithfulness towards us. But rather faith in him. In baptism we go into the waters, but in faith we rise up. And what makes us alive? What makes this new life of faith possible? Well, we read on. What saves us is God's forgiveness of our trespasses. God's forgiveness of our sins. And here... Paul again links some cultural imagery to the imagery of the cross. He tells the Colossians that their trespasses have been forgiven and that the debt that stood against them has been cancelled with its legal demands. So to begin with, we hear Paul saying that our, our record of debt has been cancelled. A better translation of this is that the record of our trespasses has been blotted out or wiped out. Now in the time of Christ, most writing will have been done in papyrus or vellum paper. And most writing was done using 
uh, inks that didn't have a lot of acid in them. So what you tended to find was that the vellum of the papyrus didn't really actually absorb any of the ink as such. It more sat on the surface. And so because paper and vellum was expensive, what a scribe would have done uh, was he literally, these were the first recyclers. So he would have recycled the paper. And he did so by taking a sponge and literally wiping off everything that had previously been written on the page. He would have blotted out, he would have wiped out everything that was written down before. And what Paul's saying is our sins are like that. Our sins, uh, the, the debt of sin that we owe to, to, to God would have been written down. You imagine like a book, you know, uh, David did this, David did that, David did the other. These is where he fell, this is what he did, this is what he did wrong. And what Paul is saying is, is, is God, the scribe, he, he has rubbed all of that out. The sheet is clean. The page is clear. There is no, um, there is no charge sheet against you. There is no crime script against you. There is nothing stands against you. Your sins, your sins have been forgiven. They have been wiped clean, like a whiteboard, like a blackboard. You know, we see it all the time with the whiteboard. You just wipe it all out. And no history of it exists anymore. And Paul says that's what's happened to our sins. They have been blotted out. They have been wiped out as if they never were. And he continues. And he gives us the second image now. And this is a powerful one, I believe. It really struck me when I was reading it. He says that he has set aside our trespasses, nailing them to the cross. Now, again, in ancient Near uh, Eastern culture, this had a, um, a known understanding uh, as well as Paul's direct attachment to the death of Christ as well. So in, in, in the time of Christ, the time of Paul, when, say, government was wanting to change or law or rescind the law or, or annul some kind of government directive, what they would have done is that they would have posted that directive on a board and they would drive a nail through it. So they would hammer a nail through it to say that this is gone. This no longer counts. This doesn't exist anymore. This law, this directive is, is history. It doesn't apply anymore. And so for the listeners of Paul, this image is very familiar to them. So when he talks about nailing their sins to anything, getting their sins up there and putting a nail through them, they recognize that this is an image that says that that thing is cancelled out. That thing no longer counts. That thing is annulled. That thing is wiped out. It no longer exists. But Paul is clearly pushing the image even further because he doesn't say your sins have been nailed to a board, which would have, would, would have painted the picture he wants to. He goes even further. He says that your sins have been nailed to the cross. And what he does is he ties the annulment of our sin to the mechanism that ensures that. It is a phrase that achieves two things. It tells us that our sins have been removed. And it points to how our sins have been removed. Paul then instantly goes on to talk about the rulers and the leaders and the authorities of the day. And he says that they are nowhere equal or as powerful as God. Because yes, they could cancel a law by sticking it to a board. They could have they removed a directive or anything like that by putting a nail through it. But only one person could get rid of sin. There's only one person in all of history who could wipe out the sins that you and I have committed. And that is Jesus Christ. He is greater than all who have come before. He is greater than all who came after. As we look in this mad world of ours, he is greater than our modern day despots and peacemakers. Only through our sins being nailed to the cross can we know that we're dealt with completely. It is the cross that cancels out the sins that previously stood against us. Only it has the power to deal completely and utterly with our sin. I don't know about you, but, but I know my sins. 
And I suspect that you don't have to think too hard about your sins either to remember them. I suspect I'm not alone in that. We all struggle with sin. Sins such as gluttony and gossiping, jealousy, slander, envy, you know, greed, lust, pride, anger, idol worship. You know, uh, these aren't my sins. These are our sins. Let's be honest with ourselves. They come up in so many forms. Blasphemy, laziness, disrespect, verbal or physical abuse, bullying, self-centeredness, carelessness. And the list could go on. And Jesus says, bring them here. Bring them to the cross. All of you. And know that the hands that were nailed to the cross hold your sins in them. Know that when Christ was nailed to the cross, he took your sin with him. And when he was taken down from that cross and placed within the tomb, know that the only thing that remains in that cross are your sins. As he was taken down, your sins remained nailed to the cross, cancelled out, wiped out, blotted out, annulled, cancelled, as if they had never existed in the first place. That's the power of the cross. The power of the cross is to cancel out what nothing else on this earth can. Our debt of sin before God. When the nails were hammered through his hands and wrists, they couldn't hold him. We know that for he rose again and he ascended, but what they could hold were your and my sins. Held there forever, completely and utterly dealt with. When I read this passage with a strong language, I'm reminded of the breadth of salvation. Salvation is salvation that is for everyone. And that includes you and me, the Gentiles, the Jews, the atheist, the Muslim, the Hindu, the everything and the nothing. It crosses all earthly groups and boundaries. And Paul wants to, us to know how we are saved. We're saved through faith, not through some physical act like circumcision or baptism. We're saved through faith in Christ and Christ alone. And this is possible only through his death on the cross. Because through that he has taken away all our sins. He has utterly removed them as if they had never existed in the first place. Some of us today have sin that needs to be dealt with. We've maybe never surrendered to Christ and tried to deal with our brokenness ourselves. And the fact is many have tried and all have failed to deal with our brokenness that way. Maybe it's time to come to the cross and let go of our sinfulness before it. Some of us have been continuing in our sin because we enjoy it. But the truth is we'll never know the fullness of our relationship with God, the joy of our relationship with God until we let go of these pet sins of ours. While we remain half in and half out. Maybe it's time to come and finally leave these things to the cross. And some of us have been holding on to our sin because we kind of think we are too dirty for God. We are too unclean. We are too sinful for God. He couldn't possibly want someone like me. But the cross is higher and broader and deeper than any sin that we have committed or will commit. So come to the cross and leave it behind.
Today we celebrate. We celebrate because our sins have been nailed, nailed to the cross. And when Christ ascended victorious to the right hand of the Father, all that was left on the cross was our sin. Dealt with forever. Praise God for that. And Christ extends his hand towards us. And he says, come with me. Come with me. Leave your sin behind. Leave your brokenness behind. Leave all of this behind. Come with me. Will you leave it behind? Will you allow him to nail it to the cross and leave it there? Amen.
And now as we leave this place, we do so in the hope that we can know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit today and every day. Amen.